that's how it began. And we have the records to show. <laughs> because, um, you know, science, when it began, it, it, metaphysics was not the big game for science. Science wanted to understand the regularities of nature, how the world behaves, not what the world is. That's why Galileo dropped the two balls from the top of the Tower of Pisa. Pisa. It wanted he, he wanted to see uh, whether one ball would arrive first on the ground or not. It's what nature does, not what nature is. But um, the Church had supremacy over the whole continent of Europe for a thousand years, right uh, from from the fall of Rome to to the beginning of the Renaissance in the 14th century or 15th century, should, I should say. Um, so that that absolute power. Look, the, the, the church was the most powerful institution in the world and it had no army except for the Templars, but then it got rid of its own army and it killed its own small army at some point. So you, you only get to do that, to be the most powerful institution in the world without an army when you control belief systems which the church did. And that was the threat that science offered to the church. It, um, it, 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 offered, it, it offered the possibility of uh, engaging with the world in a different way, through a different set of values, and therefore undermining the belief system that made the church powerful without an army. It's a tremendous threat. It's a bigger threat than to mobilize a whole army against the church, right? And it was perceived as such. So the church would not hesitate in burning a scientist at the stake like they did with Bruno in 1600 because Bruno realized that the other stars were suns and and, and therefore we were not in the center of the universe it, it was an isotropic universe extending infinitely in every direction that undermined the belief system that maintained the church as the most powerful institution and it was intolerable um, so uh, uh, Bruno would not recant. It would have been better for the church if he, if he would have recanted because it would then reaffirm the church's power structure. He didn't, so they burned him alive at the stake in a square in Rome in the year 1600. Not one scientist has missed that. <laughs> Everybody took notice that that's what could happen. So it was important to carve out a domain for science that the church wouldn't perceive as threatening. And the way to do that was to say, the church owns spirit. Uh, the, 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 the church owns psyche, which is the Greek word that we translate into sometimes soul, but certainly spirit and mind. Uh, all these words are translations from the Greek psyche. So the church had domain over the psyche, the world of spirit, the world of souls, the world of mind. But uh, scientists invented this other metaphysical domain, starting from Descartes, um, which was supposed, whatever it was, it was supposed to be non-psyche. That, that was the key criterion. Whatever it was, it was not psyche. So we are not threats to the church. Please don't burn us at the stake. And uh, as late as the 18th century, uh, um, uh, Denis Diderot, one of the two authors of La Encyclopédie, which is the founding document of the Enlightenment, which sort of succeeded the Renaissance, um, he's on record saying, um, we, we know materialism doesn't work. Probably everything is, is just instinct with life. There is no matter as such. Um, but we still have to use it as a weapon against the church. He's on record saying this. So the, the early Enlightenment figures, they knew that the whole metaphysical story around physicalism was a political tool, even a survival tool. And uh, as the Industrial Revolution kicked in as the bourgeoisie started becoming a very influential class, uh, vying for dominance against the clergy. Uh, what was initially a political tool of survival became a tool of domination. You know, from the July Revolution of 1830 onwards, it was not enough to have a dualistic belief, like the, the type of belief that even the great Goethe had. In his autobiography, he says, that uh, you got something to the to the effect. Or I'm paraphrasing him now. He says you got to be mad not to understand that uh, matter and mind are the two essential components of nature. So that's the dualistic belief that Descartes started 
to carve out a corner for science to, to do its thing without being burned at the stake. But from the July Revolution on, the game was to, to go beyond that and to say, oh, by the way, mind arises from matter. So matter is more fundamental. And the political game there is the bourgeoisie carry more cachet than the clergy. Because the bourgeoisie, you know, they are the people behind the mechanisms of the Industrial Revolution. You know, steam engines, you know, power tools and all that stuff. And that's material stuff. If you could say that mind is derivative from matter, then who rules the, the rooster? It's, it's the bourgeoisie, right? And at some point after the middle of the 19th century, uh, we started actually believing the snake oil. We started believing the bullshit, you know, because with Darwin, uh, the church was robbed of its last bastion, which is the explanation for the origin of life. Um, God designed us. And then Darwin came around and said, no, nope, we evolved. And all of that played out as a mechanism. <laughs> and then uh, the mechanism idea is sufficient. Um, then we started actually believing that. There were other reasons, psychological reasons for that as well. If you think that mind is a product of ephemeral arrangements of matter, then when you die, your ability to suffer ends. And all of your problems come to an end. And, uh, and you get rid of the single greatest fear humankind has always had, which is the fear of what we will experience after we are dead, the fear of the great unknown. And it's the fear that allowed the church to be the dominant political institution for a thousand years without an army. It is that fear. Because they com would convince you that they could make sure that your experience after death would be tolerable. They would even sell you real estate in the sky after death, right? The indulgences. Um, so to get rid of the single greatest fear our species has had over its existence, 300,000 years, is, is just about the greatest psychological you know, benefit you could get from believing in materialism. We, we don't relate to that now because we take it entirely for granted. No, so we can't relate to the advantage, the psychological advantage of that move anymore. We take it for granted now. But at the time, it was a fantastic move. It was a great relief to actually believe your political story, to drink your own snake oil. And Nietzsche was the only one who realized this. And then the only one who realized the price we would pay later for this, which was nihilism. It's the end of meaning. You know, your fear of death is gone. You're not going to suffer in hell afterwards. You don't need to fear that. No, you don't need the church anymore. You don't, no, you are not going to go to hell. There is no hell. There will be nobody there to experience anything. Um, so it, the advantage was obvious, but we didn't see then, except for phenomenal people like Nietzsche, who saw it 100 years before everybody else, the price we would pay is nihilism. It's the absolute lack of meaning. You know, you don't fear hell anymore. Now you fear life because it's vacuous, pointless. Um, and Nietzsche described it as the destiny of the last men, the letzte Mensch. Yeah. Uh, the last humans would be the correct translation. Uh, and, and that is our destiny. We are the last humans. Um, and, and therefore, we now have the psychological motivation to review what happened and try to figure out exactly what happened. And materialism was at first a political tool and later a form of uh, what psychologists call meaning compensation, sorry, fluid compensation, which is when you lose one source of meaning, you precariously try to replace that with another one. And we lost one so source of meaning, we lost transcendent meaning, the meaning of life itself when we reject it mind as a fundamental part of reality because meaning resides in mind if you reject mind as fundamental you reject meaning as fundamental and the only alternative is nihilism so we when we lost that source of meaning we fluidly compensated with other made-up sources of meaning um, one of them this is psychology one-on-one -on -one, and this is not my invention one of them is closure like, even if you lost all meaning, at least you understand what's going on and you get one up on the universe by understanding. <laughs> yeah. You see? It's like, it's yeah. all crap. It's all nihilistic. It's all a piece of crap. But at least I understand it. I get one up on the cruelty of nature by understanding how it works. 
Yes. And that science right there, right? The need for closure. That's why we put in billions in the Large Hadron Collider, where I had the honor to work as the first crew to, you know, in, back in 96, after the project was approved in 94, I was at CERN and the first team of designers of the Large Hadron Collider. We put in billions in that stuff. Why? Does it have any practical application now or in the foreseeable future? No, <laughs> it doesn't. It's purely for closure. We want to get one up on this cruel, nihilistic nature that has no meaning. Um, another form of fluid compensation is, um, um, is ego differentiation. We like to see ourselves as somehow superior. Because if there is no superior God, then only the Ubermensch will do. Nietzsche saw that too. And Nietzsche saw that God was dead and the only alternative was to transcend our own humanity. Yeah. Um, and this kind of distinction is something that motivates scientists too. Um, they are above you know, the man on the street in the sense that they understand things. Yes. So we applied all that, but uh, fluid compensation ultimately comes to an end. You cannot play the self-deceiving game forever. At some point, you have to pay the bill. You can't stay in the restaurant anymore. And then and it's now. now. Now the bill's coming. 